my academic background was initially in sociology. I started out uh, doing my bachelor's and graduate work in sociology. And it was only towards my, the beginning of the graduate program that I started seeing um, myself gravitate towards applied sociology. And more and more doing applied sociology through media. And in many ways, I still think that I'm doing applied sociology because a lot of the documentary work and the advocacy work that I do through video and, docu and documentary film um, still means that I'm continuing the work that I thought that I would be doing in, in, in field work, et cetera. It's just not as a sociologist. Uh, so that is how I started thinking about training in, in media production. As for teaching, it was not something that I had envisioned, even until the last few months of the MFA program, which sounds scary. <laughs> um, and all of a sudden, I start seeing these uh, flyers for all kinds of academic jobs appear in my mailbox. And I suspect that it's probably one of, my, uh, one of the people that I have been TAing for. I was very sh uh, kind of confident that I didn't want to do corporate work. I didn't want to be part of the industry because the, the applied independent work that I wanted to do uh, almost necessitated looking at other ways of find, finding or funding my work. So academe provided me that medium ground where I could make a living and at the same time continue being an independent professional doing media work that was largely de determined by me and uh, all the priorities that I saw that media work coming out for, from, from my uh, uh, portfolio should consist of. I think the one place where I see it coming together is uh, that in my independent work, I have continued to work um, in collaboration with organizations. So whether it takes the form of commission work, whether it takes the form of work that I'm doing independently, uh, I always see the filmmaker as somebody who is a collaborator. And it, this doesn't just apply to the work that we do to make the film. Uh, you know, we all collaborate with our cinematographers, our sound people, and so on. But I see it as a larger collaboration. It's a collaboration with civil society. And by that I mean groups that are working in all areas of uh, change. And I see that connection to be a very integral part of what I do. And at Hofstra uh, and at other universities before this, one of the things that I have done uh, and I've pushed for in my teaching is to inculcate that sense amongst the student body, to not see the academe as the be-all, end-all of their imagination, but to look cast around, to, uh, to be engaged uh, in the world around them. And not necessarily just uh, the world as it commu communicated through media, but the world as they know it immediately, uh, as a sensory kind of a thing, which means stepping outside, which means me putting them in connection with groups that are actively doing work for change on the ground. And by getting involved in supporting that work through their own media uh, expertise, the students learn uh, not just about doing media work, but they learn about how these processes work in real life, how change happens, how advocacy happens, how policy gets influenced, uh, how money is raised, how groups are fighting to promote things that they never thought about. Media Action Projects is a course that used to be offered at Hofstra under a different title. It was used to be called non-broadcast video. And it was a generic term used for corporate communication, nonprofit work, strategic media, and so on. And when I came here, I saw that course as a natural uh, sort of a crucible for some of the work that I had, been, I had been doing for media advocacy work. So we renamed the class uh, a few semesters ago. I put in a proposal to rename the class because I wanted to make the focus of the class the community-based initiatives that I saw as the core of that class. The class has two, three principles in it. One thing that I try to do in that class is I find other faculty from other disciplines who have action research. So I'll give you a couple of examples. We have done work uh, with, uh, with a professor of archaeology who was conducting uh, some digs with his students in Long Island and they were excavating uh, sites where freed slaves may have owned houses and so on. And he was very excited when I talked to him about my class. And my students did a project on a Peter Crippen house, which supposedly is one of the first houses that is not documented that uh, may have been owned by a freed slave, Peter Crippen. Uh, 
So that kind of work to me is an ideal combination where students are not only looking at their own media practices and seeing how they're contributing to documenting or advocating for something that's outside, but they're also looking at how Hofstra is participating in the community through the work of other disciplines. We need to figure out how we can use media to make the change that we so desire. Um, in, in some ways, what we have been trained to believe is that media authorship or the, the priorities of media are always set somewhere else. We are just carrying out the brief. And that change has to come along with this movement that we are now seeing, uh, what, what has been called the democratization of media, the cost, the dropping of costs of media equipment, the large number of people that are uploading videos on, online and so on. But there's yet, it, it's yet to coalesce into a, a community of sorts. And that is the biggest difference that I find in India and in online communities in the US, is by merely being online, it's, it's one thing. To change that into an actual living, breathing community is a different thing. So the big gap, in my view, is that not that people don't have the reach for the resources to create media. It's that they, have, they don't have the reach to build organic communities through which these medias will be meaningful, made meaningful, and made uh, powerful. Um, so that is the next step. Thank you.